Welcome everybody to our Sunday, March 11th webinar, How to Tap into the Writer's Life with June Gould. Hi, June. Hi. June, I'm watching our attendee count go up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna say hello to everybody before I introduce you. Hi, Anne. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Katerina, Christina, Colleen, David. You're in alphabetical order, everybody. I want to teach you some of the, remind you of some of the functionality for you because you can't see or you can't be seen or heard, but you have something called the chat room. And so, hi, Pavlina. Pavlina knows what to do. Everybody, tell us where you're, where you're, hi, Christina. Tell us where you are uh, logging in from in the chat room. Remember to, remember to choose all panelists and attendees. Okay, I'm gonna lower my voice a little bit just so the sound is okay. Everybody use the chat and tell us where you're, you're coming in from me, Deborah. Hi, Christy, I knew that was you. Toronto. <laughs> Christy Felton, someone from my neighborhood, uh, June. Christy, Christy Felton from the Firehouse Arts Center, also a poet. She found us, right on. Hi, Tony from Cambridge. Welcome back to the Guild, Tony. Hey, Roberta. Hi, Elizabeth from Hawk Mountain, PA. Mary Jane from West Lafayette. I'm guessing Indiana. Hi, Ann from Cape Cod. Hi, Mary from Venice, Florida. June, you can see it too if you open your chat room. Folks, I'm going to uh, remind you and tell those who are new to us that uh, if you could use the chat room, for any of your communications with me and with each other. If you want to ask June questions about her webinar's content, use the Q&A, okay? Please use the Q&A, reserve it for content questions of June, not technological issues or, you know, chatty stuff. Let's keep that in the chat room. And uh, if you could not use the raise hand function, we've also got a couple phone callers. Um, phone call people, you have no way of communicating with us. I apologize. So I'm gonna begin by introducing June. I know some of you are noticing that my voice is coming through June's computer. And I'm gonna try to speak more quietly so that's not as loud, but I'm gonna actually disappear once June speaks. Um, hi, Barbara Hall. Use the chat room for your hellos to everybody, okay? You reserve the Q&A folks for, um, for content questions, okay? Because only I can see the Q&A, not you all. Okay. Let me introduce June to y'all. June S. Gould, PhD, is a writer, teacher, and lifelong learner. We know that to be true about you, June. She's a writer in all of us improving your writing from childhood memories and co-author of a book of Holocaust poetry called Counting the Stones. She has done a signing at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for her novel In the Shadow of Trains. Her poetry has been published in and or by the Pearl, or by Pearl, I'm sorry, the storyteller Inkwell, Ship of Fools Press, University of Rio Grande, the Round Table, the Great American Poetry Show, and the Jewish Literary Annual. She's also written an award-winning chapter on teaching the language arts in constructivism, theory, perspectives, and practice. She's been teaching for us, for the Guild, for 30 years, and has given poetry readings, speeches, signings, and workshops at the 92nd Street Y in New York, the Holocaust Museum, the Jewish Museum, and is it the Yeshiva Museum? My apologies. Yeshiva? Yeshiva. Yeshiva Museum. And for, the, and for the Asian Writers Conference in Andros, Greece. I'm not good with the... Aegean, Aegean. Aegean. Thank you. Aegean, yes, it was wonderful in Greece. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So welcome, June Gould. Thank you. And now what, do I start? Now you start. Okay, hello everybody. So nice to hear from you, especially 
people I know from San Francisco, Marcy, and um, so many, so many of you. I'll mention you as we go along. Um, I was thinking a lot about this workshop because I was thinking about being inspired and what inspires me and what inspires some of my students and my. I would prefer to call my students learners because they're not under my arm. They're whisking off on their own very, very nicely. But here's what I was thinking. Everything, once you have your eyes open and your ears open, everything is inspiration for writing. It's just that you have to sort of put yourself in a focused mood or mindset and think to yourself, everything I do, everything I do can become a piece of writing and it could become a poem it could be a short story it could be a novel it could be a nonfiction creative piece but it starts somewhere somewhere where we as human beings look and hear and touch um, there's a wonderful quotation by um, Sharon Olds and she says poems come from ordinary experiences and objects address I lent my daughter on the way back to college, a newspaper photograph of war, a breast self-exam, the tooth fairy, Calvinist parents who, be, uh, who beat up their children, a gesture of love, seeing oneself naked over age 50 in a set of bright hotel bathroom mirrors. So many ordinary and extraordinary things. And it's the newspapers we read, the books we read. And I wanna start really with objects because sometimes we don't, very often writers will come to me and say, you know, I, I just don't know what to write about. And it's these everyday objects that are so um, astonishing that can lead to so many wonderful pieces. So I wanna start now with uh, a piece that was written by um, I have to put my glasses on for this, by Minnie Bruce Pratt, who's a pretty well-known poet. And she wrote a piece called The Blue Cup. And I believe that Marge is gonna put that on the um, screen. There it is. And she says, through binoculars, the spiral nebula was a smudged white thumbprint on the night sky. Stories said it was a mark left by the hand of night, that old she easily weaving the universe out of milky strings of chaos. Beatrice found creation more difficult. Tonight, what she had was greasy water whirling in the bottom of her sink, revolution and one clean cup. She set the blue cup down on the table, spooned instant coffee, poured boiling water, a thread of sweetened milk. Before she went back to work, she drank the galaxy that spun small and cautious between her chapped cupped hands. I always like to look at lines and say, this is my favorite, this is my favorite. But I think the most extraordinary line there is, she drank the galaxy. She didn't drink just a cup of coffee or milk, she drank the galaxy. The blue cup reminded her of that. And I have a blue cup right here. I don't know, I hope you can see it. But this was my mother's cup that she drank from when she was a young girl living in Ontario, Canada. And it's nothing like the cups that my daughters now have or my son. They had sterling silver cups. But she had this blue spatter, spatterware, splatterware, and I have it now. This is mine. And can I see the cosmos in it? Well, I certainly see layers of my mother's life. I certainly see her growing up in a strange environment where she didn't have very many Jewish friends because my mother and father, my mother and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles came from northern Ontario where they were really the only Jews in that whole area and they had the only Jewish cemetery to be buried in. And so I see this cup, I see this blue cup as more than just a souvenir, but also a story that comes out of my mother's life and out of my life and a way of connecting to the past as well as the future. 
So an object can be such an incredibly powerful thing as a start off, jump off point for your own writing. And for the times when you say, oh, I, there's nothing to write about. And you think, blue cup, blue cup. There it is. It sits on a shelf in my kitchen. And I brought it off the shelf to show you and to share with you. I want to read a couple of more poems that have objects as its root. And I'm going to be talking today about th uh, three to four areas, depending on how this time goes by. Uh, I would like to talk about objects. I'd like to talk about conversation poems. I'd like to talk about politics and conversations. And then I'd like to talk just about politics. If if we can squeeze in that terrible thing called politics of our time. So let me read some other poems to you. And some of you may want to ask some questions. You can ask questions as I go along and Marge uh, Hahn will uh, prepare those questions for me to read so that at the end of my talk, um, I will be able to answer them for you. So here's some more. This one's Excuse me. Everybody know. Excuse me, June. I should let everyone know. I'm putting the sources for your poems, the ones you're reading, in the chat room. So, folks, if you want to be tracking uh, the sources, I'm putting them in the chat room. Which am I putting up now, June? Um, I don't know if you have my tongue is divided into two or no more cake here, but either one of those would be fine. I have no more cake here and I'll find the other. Okay. You may not have the other, but. No, no more cake here is an interesting one too. And the object of course is cake. But I wanted to tell you a couple of things besides using the poems as jumping off points. There's something really interesting that happens, especially with um, non-English speaking or double speaking um, poets. Um, there's something that I had not understood until this year when I've done a lot of research on um, Mexican and South American poets who have been finally translated for us to read some extraordinary poems that are really exciting to dip into. And this particular poem, No More Cake Here, is written by Natalie Diaz. And she is, of course, a Spanish speaking, but also English speaking poet. And what, uh, what some of the poets, particularly from Mexico and South America, um, have done is something very odd that you might not uh, know about. It's called uh, split coding. Split coding is deliberately using Spanish words in an English poem or Arabic, an Arabic words in an Arabic poem or French words in an, Ameri in an English poem. It's sort of um, inserting this other language that is too beautiful or too important to leave out in a translation. Um, some people feel that it's annoying to read a poem that has suddenly got um, uh, Spanish words in it or Arabic words in it that you don't understand, but it's deliberate. It's a deliberate way of saying, listen, I'm more than writing this in English. I'm, I'm a two-tongued person. Sometimes I'm Spanish and sometimes I'm American and English. And I think some of us can relate to that as uh, just coming from whatever background we've come from. Um, my background, of course, is, is, is Russian diaspora and um, Canadian uh, English and American English. So that when I, um, when I write, sometimes there's a kind of Jewish stuff that gets in there. And it might be a word that I use, like, you know, well, I can't think of the word right now because that's not my first language. My first language really is English, but my grandparents' language was Yiddish. And so I often will say things that have certain kind of Yiddish tonation, intonation and maybe even an intonation of rhythm. So here's this, here is this no more cake here. When my brother died, I worried there wasn't enough time to deliver the 100 invitations I'd scribbled while on the phone with the mortuary. Because of the short notice, no need to RSVP. Unfortunately, the firemen couldn't come 
I had hoped they'd give free rides on the truck. They did agree to drive by the house once with the lights on. It was a party after all. I put my mom and dad in charge of balloons. Let them blow as many years of my brother's name, jails, $20 bills, midnight phone calls, fist fights, and ER visits as they could let go of. The scarlet balloons zigzagged along the ceiling like they'd been filled with helium. Mom blew up so many that she fell asleep. She slept for 10 years. She missed the whole party. My brothers and sisters were giddy, shredding his stained t-shirts and raggedy pants, throwing them up into the air like confetti. When the clowns came in, a few balloons slipped out of the front door. They seemed to know where they were going and shrank to a fistful of red grins at the end of our cul-de-sac. The clowns played toy bugles until the air was scented with rotten raspberries. They pulled scarves from Mum's ear. She slept through it. I baked my brother's favorite cake, chocolate, white frosting. When I counted, there were 99 of us in the kitchen. We all stuck our fingers in the mixing bowl. A few stray dogs came to the window. I heard their stomachs and mouths growling over the mariachi band playing in the bathroom. There was no room in the hallway because of the magician. The mariachis complained about the bathtub acoustics. I told the dogs, no more cake here, and shut the window. The fire truck came by with the sirens on. The dogs ran away. I sliced the cake into 99 pieces. I wrapped all the electronic equipment in the house, taped pink bows and glittery ribbons to them, remote controls, the Polaroid, stereo, shop vac, even the motor to dad's work truck, everything my brother had taken apart and put back together doing his crystal meth tricks. He'd always been a magician of sorts. Two mutants came to the door. One looked almost human. They wanted to know if my brother had willed them the pots and pans and spoons stacked in his basement bedroom. They said they missed my brother's cooking, and did we have any cake? No more cake here, I told them. Well, what's in the pinata, they asked. I told them, God was, and they ran into the desert barefoot. I gave dad his slice and put mom's in the freezer. I brought up the pots and pans and spoons. Really, my brother was a horrible cook. I banged them together like a New Year's Day celebration. My brother finally showed up asking why he hadn't been invited and who baked the cake. He told me I shouldn't smile that this whole party was shit because I'd imagined it all. The worst part he said was he was still alive. The worst part he said was he wasn't even dead. I think he's right, but maybe the worst part is that I'm still imagining the party. Maybe the worst part is that I can still taste the cake. Now there is um, a wonderful poem, I think a very interesting poem, that goes off into kind of a surreal, for surrealistic area and goes on this imaginary trip with who's in the house and some of the words that are used, the words we happen to know are pinata and mariachi bands. And they are so familiar to us, it's almost like we don't have to translate them, but they're there and they're there for a reason. She wants it to be a poem about a Spanish family, a Spanish speaking family. And the worst part is I can still taste the cake. And what does the cake have? It's both sweet and it's a memory and it's something that her brother liked. And having everybody put their fingers in it, I think is very interesting to taste him, to taste what he loves, to taste of something immaterial really but a taste of a human being. So now I'd like to go towards, we talked about, we talked about objects and there are so many other objects. I mean, I'm thinking of um, showers, um, plates, canned goods. And we know artists who have taken plates and, sh and canned goods and made art out of them. Well, we can make art out of those stories too. It's just that we have to claim them for uh, ourselves and part of us. So here's the next part I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about conversations. I've been very inspired by a, a poet named Hal Sirowitz, and he wrote a book, several books, but the one I have in my hand is 
Mother Said. And they're all poems. And he talks about, he has his mother speak all sorts of things to him. And we get to know his mother and his father very well. He has another whole book called Father Says. And um, I'm not sure whether this is off or on, but I'm going to, okay. Can you all hear me? I hope. So the poem is Chopped Off Arm. And his mother says to him, don't stick your arm out of the window, mother said. Another car can sneak up behind us and chop it off. Then your father will have to stop, stick the severed piece in the trunk and drive you to the hospital. It's not like the parts of your telescope that snap back on. A doctor will have to sew it. You won't be able to wear short sleeves. You won't want anyone to see the stitches. Now here's this, I think she's an awful mother. <laughs> But I remember my mother saying, don't stick your hand out the window. You can have, it, it can be chopped off. I really do. But she goes on and on in this book. And you know that she's really, you can get to know her by the things she says to her son. Well, I wrote a poem uh, that I call Mother Said. And it was inspired by Sirowitz. And I'd like to read it to you now. And remember that, first of all, my mother has died. And she'll never read this, so it's okay for me to read it. And some of you may not care about that. You may want to write a poem about your mother and let your mother see it. But I think this poem would have pained her in, in many ways. But I needed to write it because it was a way for me to understand something between the two of us. So here's conversation, write in a poem. You don't have to have an object. You don't have to have a great, great idea you have, can remember a conversation. Here's my mother. My mother said the wire bras I wear cause cancer. I said, no way. My doctor said to tell you, you should call the American Cancer Society, I said. They've been looking for genetic reasons. They're like you, she said. They don't listen. My mother said my Aunt Millie caught cancer because she chased her black grandchild when he ran into traffic. I said, that's prejudice. You don't know what causes anything, do you? My mother said. My mother said the reason adult children visit their parents is for their money when they die. I said that can't be the only reason. What other reason is there? Love, I said. You're naive, my mother said. My mother said my father wasn't up to her. That can't be, excuse me. So why don't you leave, I said. Where would I go? To your own apartment, I said. And where would that be, some dump? Well, don't complain, I said. Who's complaining, my mother said. My mother said, buy a two-family house when you get married, then we could all live together. What if I'd wanna go far away from here, I said. Why would you wanna do that, my mother said. I guess you can see my mother who was very um, <sighs> demanding. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted me to live with her on top of all the things that she said and made up and lied about. Anyway, that was my mother, and she's more than that, of course. My mother also was a wonderful cook. She was a seamstress. She made clothes for me. Um, she was a good friend to many, many people. But she also was uh, competitive, and she was also um, tried to take me over very much in her life. So I appreciate both sides of her. And somehow writing that really released me. I got a chance to know that it was, there was no conversation really with my mother. My mother always won, <laughs> even though I protested. So now I'd like to uh, share another, uh, another piece with you. And that is a piece by uh, Tony Hoagland, who has done some very interesting things with slipping conversation into his poems. And until I had read him thoroughly in his book, particularly What Narcissism Means to Me, um, I, I didn't understand quite what he was doing. And now I just love what he's doing. So here I go. Excuse me, June, yes. you want me to find an online version of that? No, no, I have it and I can read it. You don't okay. have to. As long as I know that you are, um, so I'll read it. Um, what narcissism means to me. There's socialism and communism and capitalism, said Neil, 
And there's feminism and hedonism and there's Catholicism and bipedalism and consumerism. But I think narcissism is the system that means the most to me. Could you see that he has a friend who says, makes his two cents heard, Neil? And there's, so, and Sylvia said, and here's Sylvia butting in. Sylvia said that in Neil's case, narcissism represented a heroic achievement in positive thinking. And Anne, who calls everybody sweetie pie, whether she cares for them or not, Anne lit a cigarette and said, only miserable people will tell you that love has to be deserved. And when I heard that, a distant chime went off in me, remembering a time when I believed that I could simply live without it. Neil had grilled the corn and sliced the onions into thick white disks and piled the wet green pickles up in stacks like coins. And his chef's cap was leaning sideways like a mushroom cloud. Then Ethan said that in his opinion, if you're going to mess around with self-love, you shouldn't just rush into a relationship. And Sylvia was weeping softly now, looking down into her wine cooler and potato chips. And then the hamburgers were done, just as the sunset in the background started cutting through the charcoal clouds, exposing their insides black, streaked, dark red, like a slab of scorched rare steak. Delicious but unhealthy, or depending on your perspective, unhealthy but delicious. The way that deep inside the misery of daily life, love lies bleeding. He always has these sensational endings. But there were these friends of his that all commented in the poems. And so I have a poem that I wrote that does the same thing or similar things. Um, there's my mother in this poem. I, I do a lot of poems about my mother, I guess, without realizing it. Springboards, visit from my mother on my birthday, Andros, Greece, where I taught. My mother sits on the ledge of my balcony, overlooking the pool and the Aegean Sea. She blocks my view of the islands, geraniums, bougainvilleas, and beach umbrellas. She says she bleached the sheets on my hotel bed and scoured the sink with borax and banami. My friend Barbara, the psychoanalyst, says it takes more than a breath to get over a mother's death. My daughter Liz says I have a vivid imagination. But I swear there is my mother in a swirl house dress, 40s wedgies, her rimless glasses perched on her nose like mine. Why are you there? I ask as the ferry to Tino sticks its nose out of the rocky cliffs and sails silently across my page. It's your birthday, right? She winks, birthing you is like God building Andros Island, pushing it up and out of the sea, no small thing. Go back to Brooklyn, I beg. You don't belong here among Greek ruins and broiled octopus. My mother is indifferent to ferry schedules or broken ancient pottery. She doesn't want to climb the steps to the Acropolis or say the names Diana, Dionysus, Aphrodite, or Apollo. Instead, she gazes at a boy in an orange bathing suit climbing out of the hotel pool. I write the words, boy in an orange bathing suit, and she is gone. Once I write what I perceive, she no longer has hold of me. That passage and that poem is in my book, Beyond the Margins, Rethinking the Art and Craft of Writing. And I do believe we're on for another half hour. Is that right? Yes, we are. Yes. 7.30 to 8.30. Okay. Well, here are some more poems about objects. And here, is also, here are also memories. And I wanted to say that memories and objects are often very much interlinked. And when we look back at our childhoods, those memories are extremely clear and extremely um, uh, emotionally charged. And so to write about memory is often to write a very good piece because when a piece is, um, comes from an emotional center and has vivid images that go with it for all the senses, we have a good piece of writing. That's one way to know we have a good piece of writing is when it's not abstract, when it's highly detailed, and when it ha is emotionally charged. So here's a poem I wrote. It isn't even finished. I just want you to see that sometimes it's a process to write and to be inspired to write. 
And I was inspired very much by the horrible things that have been going on in this country in terms of guns. And I had had a dream about um, somebody with a gun in my dream. And I thought, my God, even my dreams can't be private anymore. I can't just have a dream about something utterly belonging to me. I have to have this gum, gun enter. And so I say in this poem, and the title of the poem is, Do Not Come Into My Dreams With Guns. My childhood nightmares will fight you. Rabid, vicious wolves will grab your trigger finger, bite you to bits, chase you around my neighborhood until they grab you for good on the steps of PS 92. That's where I went to elementary school. If you survive and naively hope for support from my mean teachers, they will throw you into their classroom's wardrobe, grab you by your throat, and make you write, I will not scare my friends with guns 100 times. Nightmare me into our neighborhood candy store, and we will throw seeded rolls at you, bat you on the head with comic books. My friends Roberta and Robert will play punch ball on your face, and we will spin you dizzy on red leatherette stools. The lady with a fake arm in our neighborhood took all arms and leg offs in my nightmares. She made me wash them in our sink with kosher soap, then screw them back on while she repeated, arms, 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 and I said, disarm. If you haven't flown from my dreams by then, my mother's robe will spring off my bedroom door and whoosh you onto our fire escape until you fall into the garbage cans below our window. If the scary images in my nightmares could get rid of you, your guns, your rage, and instead teach you to use your trigger finger to summon us for our warm arms instead of your armaments, it would be good. So that was another one that was, um, came out of really the news um, about guns being uh, on TV and in the New York Times and everything else I read so much that, um, okay, hi. I have a question for you, June. Okay, so good. I remind everybody to use the Q&A. June, do you find that most of your poems emerge when something external to you aligns with something internal that came first? Or do you ever turn something external that you have an intellectual response to? Do you ever use that to find its way into something internal? Did that make sense? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think I've changed a lot since the beginning of time when I started writing, which is a long time ago. Um, I think that what I used to do was have almost everything emotional coming from me with very little outside um, intervening so that my memories were my memories and it, they weren't influenced really by too much until I began to expand in my own mind with what else was going on at, at the time that I was writing. If I was writing about um, my my uncle returning from the war, World War II, um, and I was um, sitting on a couch um, looking at my toes, playing with my toes. It's actually a photograph of me playing with my toes. I was like probably one and a half. What did ha playing with my toes have to do with World War II? Well, I found a way to link those, and I worked very hard on the linkage and understanding that children, plenty of children were playing with their toes during the war and, and how did the war affect them and how many ways did, was I affected by my uncle who really was, um, he really was affected very, very deeply by the war for the rest of his life. And of course, I still have my toes. And when I look at them, even now, I think of that, those baby toes. So it sort of goes around and comes around. But lately, I've been so upset and disturbed by um, the, 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 the guns in the schools and the killings of young people that I sometimes start with that. I can't, get, I can't let go of it. It's just so powerful. And I have to then look within to see where that links up with, with me. And it does link up with me. I mean, that uncle that returned from the war, probably killed, I don't know, but he probably or may have killed people with a gun, with a big gun, with a rifle. But it's, um, 
it, it raises so many questions about, you know, what, what are we used to? Uh, what's fair in war that isn't fair when you're going into a school? And is, is it ever fair to kill another person? So it's, it raises a lot of issues for me in terms of my memories of the past and what my parents went through with I, when I didn't really understand it. I know that my grandparents listened to the radio every single night to hear whether they could figure out where my uncle was and that I don't remember a great emotion. I don't remember anybody crying, but I remember the radio. I remember them sitting near it as though it was a TV set. And so that one thing will, one thing inspires the other. But I do think that I, it could be my age that I'm willing to go outside of myself and bring it in rather than be, being in and going out. I don't know. That's an interesting question that I have to I have to look back at a lot of my poems and see what, what I've done. And that's really another interesting thing is to collect your poems and to put them in a folder or put them in a, a three leaf binder and have them to analyze and to look back on to see how one's life changes because it does it changes for, for many reasons yeah any other questions thank you yeah folks just a reminder to use the q a any questions you want to ask of june it's uh we have about 20 minutes we're going to want to tell you about her upcoming four-week webinar in april we'll want to leave five minutes for that i'll also uh let you who are on the call now know that after our webinar with June completes, we're going to do our All Voices Open Mic, which is an hour. Uh, we have an hour allotted. I, I need more readers, y'all. Um, and our readers are for three minutes, three minutes of your own writing. You have to be a field member to read. I hope those of you who are non-members will stay on to listen. Uh, but if you want to read it, if you're a field member, let me know in the chat room. And uh, that's my plug for now. Ask away. Hey, June, there's a question. Oh, goody. All right. From Gary. Hi, Gary. It's inspiring to see you freely let your mother appear in your poetic process and hear you observe the same and reflect. Do you think you will write on this pattern or the place this has, the psychological fact of your mother as a poetic element in yourself, a second plane of your poetry? Yeah, I've written a lot about my mother and um, it's helped me understand myself and my mother better. And I, I, I did, do want to say something that I you know, have all these notes on the side of, of my desk. And one of the notes is don't forget to talk about the vein of gold because I could be writing um, on and on and on and on. But if I don't look at the poem eventually I will not have an ending for it, and I will not know why I'm writing it. So in, in so many cases, um, there is a vein of gold in, our, in, in memory when we're writing memory, but it's just, um, it's just a recollection or a nostalgia if you don't look for the vein of gold, which is really the deepest, deepest meaning of what the poem is about. The deepest, deepest meaning in Andros Greece, when my mother comes to me as a spec, you know, spectral ghost in a sense, and is still trying to take charge of my life, is that I can't write if I have her in my head telling me to be, it's got to be better, it's not good enough, you haven't spent enough time on it, uh, why are you writing about your memories again? If I can get rid of her sitting on my shoulder as a critic, I can go deeper and deeper in, within myself to understand that she blocks me. If I have her too, too uh, keenly in my lens, I will be blocked. And I don't see the boy in the bathing suit get out of the pool in that poem until I can sweep her away. Now, I don't kill her, but I just get rid of her for that poem. And I don't need her there to write my own poetry. And the same thing with um, what she says to me, you know, you, you do this and you do that. And, you know, she tells me all these things. The vein of gold there is I got away. The end of the poem, I, I, I want to leave. I don't stay with her, meaning I don't live with her. I don't live with her in my head as, as like a super ego. Um, I'm my own person. 
but to get to be my own person, I've had to write about it. That's, that's my cure is writing about all of those things. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, June, we have a couple more questions and folks have asked follow up Gary, if you want to follow up there, we can make this as much a conversation as possible. All right, June, this is from Susan Hagen in Montana. How have you learned to live the writer's life and what does that mean to you? Well, I, um, first of all, I think it has to do with being wide awake. It's extremely important to me to have all my senses working all the time and seeing things that other people might not even notice. Um, I was, has, I've been often criticized by my partner, Amy Waite, for um, going out to dinner and listening to what people are saying behind me and, and across the way. And he's, when he first met me, he said, you know, aren't you, why don't you listen to me? Why are you listening to them? Well, I'm listening to them because they inspire my writing. So I have to be open. There's an openness that I have to have. When I go anywhere and do anything that I say to myself, that could be a poem, that could be a short story, that could, oh, that could be a novel. I have to be alert and wide awake to the whole world, to the whole universe, to in order to um, get into the writer's life. And then I have to produce. I have to sit in front of my computer, which can be fun or not fun, depending on you know where I am in my work. And I have to work every day. I've written a novel. No one told me to write a novel. No one, not my mother, not my father, not my friends. No one. I wanted and needed to write a novel. I needed to unpack what a novel was for myself. And so um, I thought of myself as a writer. And I think it's not easy to say to yourself, I'm a writer, when nobody else may know it or think it. But one of the things I do now is when somebody says, what do you do? I say, I'm a writer. I do lots of other things too. But I must name myself, you must name yourself a writer, and you must give the time that it takes to be a writer. And you know what else it takes to be a writer? Not just writing, reading. I have a bookcase behind me, you're only seeing a part of it, it's like the whole wall long. I read and read and read, and every time I read, I get something that I need. And no one writes without some forebears. And I like to say that, well, what I, what I think a lot of men like to say is um, we stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. I like to say we hold the hands of the women and the men who came before us. And particularly women, that's who we need to be reading now. And particularly women from third world countries who have something to tell us that we need to know right now. And we are lucky because there have been many more translations of those women's works than ever were there before. And I like to read those translations, wishing I could speak the language because I know it must be even more beautiful and wonderful. But in some cases, the, uh, both languages are there and you can look back and see, oh my goodness, the original rhymed. The translation doesn't rhyme. The original has uh, all kinds of alliteration. Oh my God, why didn't they alliterate when they were translating? So you do lose something in those, in those translations, but you also gain, you gain the essence of the words and the essence of the person. So that's an, another answer, but you've got to work at it. You've got to read, you've got to write, and you also have to share. I've been in a writing group for 25 years, the same people in the group. If one of us dies, we are in big trouble. We have to invite somebody new, but we're all aging together. And we're all reading and we're all bringing our work to be critiqued. And it's important to open oneself to be critiqued because you get better with critique. If you have the right people in your group, you have to be sure you have people who critique gently without killing you and give good suggestions um, and, and support you in everything that you want to do with writing. And then you're in the writing world. You're a writer. June, that was a beautiful segue to the next question from Christy Felton from my neck of the woods. How do you balance creativity and editing? Um, I let myself go like a maniac in a first draft, even a second and third draft. I don't do much editing until I, I feel like my feelings and my words are out. Um, I'm good enough now, after 30 years of this or more, more than 30 years, 
I'm good enough now to kind of do some editing in the midst of a first or second draft, but full editing, I wait until the end. I, I don't want my critical side to interfere with what's flowing out because it's not every day that something flows out. And when it flows out, you want to give it its, its go. You want to look at it as, as a river or a stream and let it go. And you don't, you don't put a barricade up and dam it up with damning uh, thoughts about your own work. And then I, I do a, when I bring my poems to my writing group, and they really work it over the coals. They haven't seen it. They don't know any, much about it. Then, I, then it gets the final edit. And I can tell you, because I published books before, that when I published The Writer and All of Us with E.P. Dutton, I had a copy editor, and she found three million mistakes. So even if you, even if you think you found every issue, everything to be edited, you, you can't do it yourself. It really is a community um, affair. So don't think you're alone and don't make yourself be alone in writing. Let other people help you and question you and find out what, they, what you mean. I have many times gone to my group and they, I finish a poem and they say, what does that mean? I had somebody even say, you know, you're pretty weird <laughs> because you don't know really exactly what you mean sometimes and you have to just get it out there and not be too critical until you're ready to publish it, to send it out, or to gather it in as your own book. Yeah. Thanks, June. Here's another uh, from Mary Saw. I think so. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Mary. I've been asked many times if I've written a book about the subject I'm sharing with others. It's just my life, capital L life. I'm simply living it. Yet others are interested wanting more. This is where I wonder, what do I choose to write about, where to start? Wow. Well, even when, you, even when the great writers have written their novels, they've often started at the end, they start in the middle, then they sit on the floor and they regather re everything and they cut and paste and they create something that flows as, a, as an entity. So I think you start where you feel like starting. You don't say, oh, I have to start at age one. You start with the hot topic. You start with um, something that's really been bothering you or, or, or making you feel good or making you feel terrible. And you just write that until that, that's out and then you write the next thing. So you don't have to worry about beginning, middle and end at the beginning. At the beginning, you're just writing to get the flow, to get the meaning, and you can start anywhere you want. In fact, in, in the book that uh, I was reading from, um, Beyond the Margins, I keep saying what that means, Beyond the Margins, is you don't have to write like someone else. You can take their ideas, but you can go beyond the margins of what has ever been written before. That's what makes a really extraordinary piece of writing. And if you read autobiography, you'll see that um, Memoir is not autobiography. It's not one thing after another, starting at age one. It's chosen hot spots that are really meaningful, that have made you change or have put blockades in front of you that you want to uh, bring down. It's, it's, the, it's a wall that we don't want. We don't want a wall, not in writing and not in Mexico. There's my political side. June from Pavlina, in, who's in Massachusetts. Have you ever had any doubts seeing yourself as a writer? Yes, I've had lots of doubts, of course. First of all, I, I am a teacher and I've taught on the college level and the graduate level for, for many, many years. And I often go between, it's like the split tongue of the person who speaks two languages. I go between my teaching world my grandmother world, and I go to the world of, of my writing. So yeah, I, sure, everybody has doubts, but I, I, I put those aside. First of all, I sort of decided that all the doubts come from my mother anyway. <laughs> She's the one that would have said, who do you think you are? You know, Why do you want to be alone? Why do you want to go your own way? So it's critics that sort of could have put a kibosh on you. So I don't try, I try not to think about that. I, I think of myself as a writer. I might not be 
the greatest writer that ever lived. I know I'm not. But I'm a writer in the sense that I try to make meaning out of life and get more from life because I write it down. I live life twice, uh, as Aeneas Nin said, when I lived it and when I write about it. So I have a longer life than most people because I live it twice. That's it. Any other question? Yeah, from Gary. Follow up. A creative thought inspired from listening to you where your mother leaves your shoulders leaving you free to write your own thing do you think you could someday write about why you write what you write without any explicit back reference to the mother for the reader assumption provides the depth of possibility into the self of the writer just an inspired curiosity yeah yeah i think that I don't write just about my mother. I chose those pieces to write today because I, I wanted to give you a sense of that. You could start with conversation. You could start with remembering conversation with anyone, not just mother. But I don't write poems all about my mother. I have many, many poems I've written about other things. I was at one time extremely involved with the Holocaust because part of my family was killed during World War II um, in Europe. And um, I wrote a book that's very, very political about, I had a fellowship to go to the Holocaust sites and I went and wrote a, a very long book about it. And uh, I wrote it with two other women who were also very involved with Holocaust. So I, there's not, my mother doesn't even occur in that book, but my, and my relatives don't either really. What occurs are my thoughts about visiting the Holocaust sites and being tremendously affected by them and wanting to get that out into the world because my family sort of buried that part of our past and I wanted to clear it up. But yeah, I write whatever comes to me. Um, yes, very much so. I, in fact, I have a piece, well, I have a piece about my father, <laughs> would you believe, and isn't even about my mother. And um, it's a piece I hope I can find. Um, glasses. Um, yes, it's a piece about um, my father was a my father was a mailman. And um, I, 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 I was always a little bit ashamed that that was all he was because he was a very intelligent man. He had many very good qualities. But he did this very to me felt like a menial job. He could have been a professor or he could have been a teacher. He could have been a social worker. He could have been, could have had a business, but that's what he did. And he got up at very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. And he um, came home very early, came home at three o'clock in the afternoon. And um, I wanted to find a way to um, revere him and not to think of him as just an ordinary person that could have done better. I wanted to find a way to, um, to, to find, I wanted to find him in a sense. And you know, I don't even believe in the word find or discover. I really believe in the word make me, the words make meaning. I wanted to make meaning of my father's life. And I had spent so much time, you know, uh, getting away from my mother in my head uh, and my father was such a very, really benign figure. He never hurt me. He never was mean to me. He just was a nice person. And so I wanted to sort of give him a tribute. And um, I'm looking for the, the poem, and here it is. And um, I'll read it to you. And you'll see that it's not just about my father. It, here's where I begin to make connections to the outer world that he lived in. This is called Dead Letters. And um, I think something that's really interesting is that I'm a writer and my father delivered letters. And I, it took years to understand that maybe there was some co deep connection between his being a deliverer of letters and me being a deliverer of words, okay? This morning, three, three mailboxes encircled by blue hydrangeas stood like shrines at attention at the ends of their driveways. Others leaned as if they received a blow to the head. Two, 
On many cold snowy nights, I slid letters into the half open mouth of the green iron mailbox on our Brooklyn corner. Spirals of snow, buses lumbering downtown, and my letter were the only things moving. I mailed my mother's Yiddish letters to my grandfather, then I walked around the block imagining letters winging from my grandfather's hands to my mother's kitchen table. I loved the jumps, hops, and sudden twitch of their ink. Three, my mailman father carried a leather pouch on his shoulder, like a troubadour of sentences. Williamsburg, his territory, had horse carts, laundry drying on lines strung from tenement to tenement, bathtubs in kitchens and noise. Those poor immigrants were a wary people, but they welcomed my father's envelopes. He held news of the war in his outstretched hands, reports of sons, husbands in dangerous places, letters they saved, smelled, held close to their faces, and read over and over, especially when their loved ones didn't return. Four, somewhere along the line, words and sentences we cared about vanished. Words like dear, sincerely, yours truly. Maybe a warning came in the letters we never received. It wasn't our fault if warnings came to our old addresses or without stamps. P.S. We continue to look for that last letter sealed with a kiss. We inspect our boxes, impatient to find it, even on holidays when mail never comes. So that's about my father, and it's about my understanding of his, his world, and that he didn't just deliver letters, he connected with people. And that's a beautiful thing. And then I saw myself connecting with people through words rather than letters in an envelope emails instead. Any other questions? Yeah, June, I'm going to uh, make a, a request of everyone to stop asking questions just because of time. Anyone who's participating in the All Voices Open Mic will be accessing on the same uh, webinar link. I'm sure they won't mind entering our conversation. So if we go a little over, I have no problem with that, but I do want to respect their time. So I'm gonna answer these, ask June these last two questions. Then we're gonna give you um, uh, information about June's upcoming four week webinar. And June will let you know where else you might find her and her work, anything I haven't mentioned. And then we'll call it a night or a day or what, whatever time of, of, of day it is for you. June, how many times a month does your critique group meet and does it it used to meet twice a month, and now it twice only a month? once a month. Yes, we met twice a month for many, many years. Is and it now, author? Excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we yeah we meet now we meet once a month. We meet for three hours, and um, we used to go out for lunch first, and we don't do that anymore. We bring our lunch, and we really are very serious about our time frame and when we meet and how long and where we meet at uh, Barbara. Uh, Haber's office. She's a psychoanalyst in Manhattan, and we meet on West 83rd Street in her office. And there are six of us. There are six of us. Mm -hmm. Different genres or styles, June? Um, some, yes, there are people doing writing their memoirs. There are people who um, are trying to write a, a, a novel, and then there are poets. Yeah. This is a good question to close on, June. Uh, at least in our Q&A portion from Marisa, who lives now in Florida. What are some of the rituals you have for writing, such as taking a walk or having tea or coffee or a favorite pen? Or are these, are, are these just props? Do you need rituals to write? Yeah, my ritual, one of the, my rituals is writing in long, my first draft is always in longhand. And it's gotta be like that. I can't just go to the computer. I want it to be in longhand. I wanna have it there with all the words and misspelled and whatever, whatever happens, I don't care. Um, another ritual is I usually wanna, I work really well in the morning. And um, I was on several retreats uh, with, um, uh, with retreat houses in uh, Virginia. And I noticed that the artists got up early in the morning 
no, what am I saying? The writer, we got up early in the morning and wrote. That's sort of, we were close to our um, imagination and to our unblocked self in the morning. Artists got, got to work like eight o'clock at night and they worked all night till, till breakfast. Composers were there playing, you know, composing on the piano. They also got up late. So the writers got up early. And so it was very interesting to see that because I was with a lot, a lot of other writers. So I still get up in the morning. I still try to do a draft or write something that I've noticed. I usually make lists and, um, and I write until I'm done. And sometimes I write right, right past uh, dinner or I write past lunch. And one of the things that happens for me that I didn't mention is not only do I live life twice, but I stop life moving so quickly and I'm in my own space, my own time frame. And that time frame has become uh, very interesting. For example, I remember writing something about leather chairs in my novel. There were two leather chairs in the character's apartment. And I got up to get a snack and I looked for those chairs. They, they weren't there. I had made them up in the novel. So yeah, there are rituals of getting up and getting a cup of coffee and wasting my time and sometimes cleaning something that doesn't need cleaning. I ha it's, a, it's a battle to keep that time frame sacred. And I try to do it as much as I possibly can. And the more I do it, the better I get. The more I write, the better writer I am. The more I read, the better writer I am. Excellent, June. Thanks so much. June, I want to give people the quick and dirty on your upcoming four-week webinar. And I'll, I'll read the title. The title is a good one, y'all. Beyond the Margins, The Power of Memory, and the Stamina of Women's Words to Change Ourselves and the World. You talked about the importance earlier, June, of uh, reading other women's words, especially women from third world countries. So you mean it. Uh, four consecutive Sundays, folks, all four consecutive, all, all four Sundays of April, which are the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th. I'm going to put that info in the chat room. You can also go to our website, the events page, www.iwwg.org slash events. I'll put it in the chat room, but you'll find it at our website. And I want to tell you there's an early bird special just for a week through next Sunday, the 18th, $69 for members, guild members. That, by the way, is a $55 annual fee, $99 for non-members, and the price goes up 20 bucks after the 18th to 89 members, 119 non-members. Folks, that's a, that's a good value. Uh, I don't mean to sound like a telethon, but these webinars are gonna be 90 minutes each. And um, so again, 69 early bird for members, 99 non-members. June, can you tell us a little bit about what people can expect from the content of those four weeks? Yes. Which, by the way, is on the website. Sorry, June, outline, but if you could say more. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really um, getting people to write, uh, use, perhaps using some forms, but breaking the forms. In the breaking of the forms, finding what one's own voice. But I also am um, very interested in the word stamina, that our women's language has stamina. We, when we say what we need to say and we get over being too shy to say it out loud, we have power. And that power, you're seeing it all over. You're seeing it with the Me Too voices and you're seeing it with uh, the people that are, that are against uh, guns. We have to realize the power of, and the stamina of our language. So I'm gonna be bringing that out quite a bit, but I'm also going to be talking about uh, how one piece that you write has within it the potential for another 20 pieces, how one piece can be linked to so much more, how one person's writing can inspire our own writing, how, um, how how we can become writers out of our uh, ordinary lives and know that a that a cup and a shoe and a and a lamp and a tissue can become also become uh, great pieces of writing. After all, there is a poem about a beautiful vase, right? 
You know the one I mean? Yes. So um, we, we can make beauty. And, and I also want to say that I want to talk about the difference between just running our mouths off and having a nostalgic um, thing going on and making a piece into art. How do we do that? How do we craft a wonderful piece of writing to become art? And that has a lot to do with finding meaning and finding the richness of words and realizing that we have stamina behind us. So those are the things we'll cover. Wonderful. So everybody, uh, I'm going to say thanks to June. If you want to say thanks to June or put any closing acknowledgments and comments in the chat room, June, no, June can look at that. She'll be seeing that, reading that. And uh, if you want to stay with us for our All Voices Open mic, thanks to those of you who are here to read. We went only six minutes over, so thanks for waiting for us. June, I hope you're seeing the comments. Uh, I haven't seen them. Oh, thank you. Thank yep. you. Yep. Oh, very nice. So scrolling up to the ceiling. Thanks, everybody. Great. And a, a replay of this video. It'll also be on our YouTube channel, IWWG channel, if you want to replay it, folks. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, June. Bye. Forward to you in April, June. Okay. June, June, and June. <laughs> June and April. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Actually, June, I, I yeah. like you inadvertently. You actually have to turn, uh, take yourself away because I can't close the meeting because we're oh, okay. Because you're having another meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm escape. I'm escaping. Yeah. Escape. Uh, blah 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 blah. I'm gonna try. try. Yeah. I have to put my glasses. Okay. Exit full screen. Okay.